want to welcome everyone back to the Pete Quinono show. Thomas, it feels like we haven't talked in like four or five weeks or like a month or so. Man. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah, it's been a minute, even for me. I realize, I realize, um, I my my content workflow isn't what yours or or Jay Burden's or some of the fellas is. Like I I, I probably I probably look that probably makes me look like a special ed kid or something. <laughs> In my in my defense, I um you know, even when my health was better, I I tend to favor highly conceptual topics and that kind of requires deep dives like on my end to prepare that kind of stuff. But you know, it um I remain impressed by the fact that you guys managed to be able to bang out the content you do with at the volume you do and it's always high quality. But um, oh. yeah, and uh, I, I'm gonna drop a sit rep on my Substack. But yeah, since I'm since I've been back from Arkansas, like I haven't I haven't done shit. Like I haven't answered people's texts or emails. This is supposed to be my big week to catch up on some long form stuff. Like like none of that was getting done. Like I'm I'm sorry for that. Um, I I've not been feeling well. But um, today. Yeah, you suggested, we, um, and I and I yeah. and I um I agree. A series, or at least I, I'd like to go over three episodes, but at least two, on the subject of Ernst Nolte, not just his thought, and kind of his particular school of revisionism, but what he represents. You know, he was a student of Heidegger, and he became very close to the Heidegger family, and that's important. It's important not just what Heidegger in context, and I generally agree with people, including Leo Strauss, interestingly, who I, I don't have nice things to say about in terms of his ethics. Um, but uh, he did have insight into like the Western intellectual tradition. Heidegger was kind of the last continental philosopher, I think, and Nolte was very much the heir to that tradition, you know, um, that began with people like Meister Eckert and continued with obviously Hegel and Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. And that, that alone renders us, him a, a significant personage, but it's also, people don't really understand what, revi what revisionism is. It's not just a matter of taking narratives that have been mythologized by ideologically committed peoples and institutions that have been able to utilize a bully pulpit, you know, to kind of force those perspectives on, you know, on, um, on, on kind of the historical canvas generally. But it, it's also why these controversies came about owe to a, um, a certain crisis in um in a in, in the western concept itself um not i i don't just mean ontologically you know in in, in terms of you know questions people pose themselves um severally and, and and collectively you know like who are we like what 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 is our culture you know like what do do we do we believe in god i mean those things are obviously important but i mean um the uh the collision with uh, modernity and make no mistake, it was a collision of Western man and the cat the catastrophes that ensued from this, that can't be overstated. Okay. Um, and Nolte, his brand of revisionism is very much grounded in that describing that process and identifying the 20th century and you know, the kind of the, the intellectual paradigms that were emergent in the 20th century and the kind of great ideologies that gave rise to the the Second World War um, and beyond. Those are those are derivative of this process. And the, the reason why people develop a sort of blindness about this is twofold, in my opinion. Part of it is obviously there's a, a there's a there's a dominant narrative about the second world war that the current regime is, is a very 
it has got it's got a very strong interest in sustaining. Not just because it, it it derives its moral legitimacy from this narrative, but in in ontological terms, the way the world is structured, um, morally, politically, um, in, in um, it, just in absolute conceptual terms, you know, derives from this narrative. But beyond that, there's an inability, particularly in, I think, Anglophone intellectual traditions, to really understand continental philosophy. Like even when the even when the variable is being described within that tradition, you know, touch and concern um, Anglophone cultures as much as they do, you know, Germanic or Francophone ones. There's a there's an inability to really sort of approach those things on on the correct terms. Like even if even if I'm not even talking about accepting the the postulates they're in. I'm saying that there's this there's there's an entirely different conceptual vocabulary for uh, approaching these things. And it's not just because, you know, oh the you know the the English and the Scots are are pragmatic. That's not that's not what it is. I mean that that's like a shorthand for you know, kind of university types who teach history of philosophy or history of science courses. That's we're talking about something both more opaque and, and more kind of deliberate, deliberately maintained, you know. But um, really, when Nolte talks about revisionism, he's talking about what exactly happened in the 20th century, okay? And he's talking about what exactly national socialism and fascism represented contra capitalism and communism, you know, um, and this was not, I mean, anybody who's educated on the subject, you know, knows that national socialism had nothing to do with nationalism, whatever that means. That, that kind of thing was dead anyway by, you know, by, um, by the turn of the 20th century, you know, and it wasn't just, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't just a matter of, you know, quote unquote, scapegoating people, because that, that doesn't make any sense. You know, I mean, even if, even if one accepts kind of court history claims that for no particular reason, this Habsburg Austrian in the form of Hitler just decided he didn't like Jewish people for, for some social reason, you know, that wouldn't people would, people wouldn't respond to some, some man's like petty, like personal biases. Like, why would they? That's not, that's not the way things work. Okay. Um, and uh, finally, understanding how the kind of dehumanization, the process of dehumanization at scale, whereby human lives, the the, the horror of, of, of human lives to the, you know, at um, at the level of millions being unceremoniously extinguished, like ceased to, ceased to be impactful. You know, like why that happened and why that was inevitable and how there was a mirror of what preceded it um, in the case of the Third Reich, and as the war situation deteriorated, the onset of the categorical extermination of, of people who were identified as standard bearers of the enemy idea. Okay, these, these are the concerns that Ernst Nolde has. So when we talk about revisionism, we're not uh, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about arguing over like gas chambers and whether they existed and things like that. Um, because you've already lost, you've already lost the proverbial plot if you're doing that. Like, yes, there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of, um, perjured testimony relating to the instrumentalities of execution and things. Yes, there's a lot of hyperbole that stands in for, you know, actual documented events. And that kind of thing should be rebutted, but it's not what we're talking about. Okay. And, um, you're not in the game of your own notion is basically, you know, I accept court history, but, you know, this is wrong because this many people couldn't have been killed. Like, that's not what we're talking about. And um, if you're counting, if you're counting casualty lists or you're, or you're aggregating estimates of counter-value attrition as, as some sort of, like, atrocity contest, you know, that, I mean, that, that's, that's incredibly perverse, but it's also not, you're, you're missing the point. You know, um, so I know people will be like, 
probably to them, they're like, well, how's Nolte revisionist? He, he doesn't do what Ernest Zundel did or does and, and just claim none of this happened. Zundel's not a real revisionist. He was some kind of troll. He was some sort of pre-internet troll. Um, and don't get me wrong, like, I, I, there's a place for that. Like, Tom Metzger was, was in some ways one of those two, but that's not, that's not real history. And I realize I'm digressing, but, um, Fred Leuchter, um, is a guy you should look into if you're concerned with instrumentalities and, and kind of a, a direct evidentiary rebuttal of some of the claims we're talking about. I mean, Leuchter's got, um, something of a tragic background um owing to uh the fact that kind of like alex jones today like there was very much singled out for destruction by the regime when when his um when, when he when he when he developed a, a high profile which he did not cultivate at all but that's um <clears throat> that's kind of outside the scope of what we're talking about robert farrison is another one if then i i guarantee you in the comments section or whatever people are going to say that like i'm not i'm, I'm not giving a fair shake or whatever to to what they can to the people they consider to be kind of like you know the the authors and and writers who um concept the original canon but getting into um what uh our our subject for the day um a lot is made of of heidegger's purported um affinity for national socialism and even people who are sympathetic to Heidegger, they seem to misunderstand that. The claim is, well, Heidegger was attracted to Nazism, you know, because he was a German patriot. And then when he realized that these were horrible people, um, he retreated from that. And or they or they claim that um, you know, he he, he coveted the rectorship of Freiburg University, and this, this was simply a career decision or something. Like none none of that even comes close to the truth of the of the situation heidegger was concerned first last and always with the crisis of western civilization okay and this in his opinion had been underway at least since the third years war and probably way well before in terms of the the kind of cultural mind um heidegger's notion is that the function of culture, what culture is, the culture relates directly to the question of being. Um, this the translating exactly what he means by being is is difficult. It's one part logos, it's one part qualia, it's one part consciousness, it's one part sentience. But the way to understand it in kind of short shorthand. What's hand, what's, que what's qualia? Quelia is basically what people who study consciousness, it's what they define as like that intangible factor that like makes humans human. It goes, it's something beyond self-awareness, but that it's like ill-defined in, in, in quantitative terms. But it's basically that combination of, you know, the ability to reason abstractly, self-awareness, um, the and the ability to like act intentionally like therein. That, that that makes up like the human consciousness is distinguished even from the most intelligent animals okay um it's a neuroscience term i believe that's its original kind of um provenance but you know in fundamental senses um being is always kind of this question that that, that that's that that's 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 ever present okay um you're thrust into the world, you know, as a baby and basically the process of your mind developing um, is, is the process by which, you know, you come to understand being, you know, and even like even, even the most dull witted human being, um, there's times at which, you know, he's he's metaphorically speaking, startled by the, the strangeness of his his existence in the world. OK, that's even the most primitive societies have some notion of God. Okay, even if it's just some idolatrous mock up of a bull or something, because, you know, we, we slaughter the bulls and from there, you know, we can eat and then we can survive. So that is God. Okay. Um, so being to Heidegger and to traditionally Aryan man, 
or Indo-European, if you prefer the kind of neologism, was always an open-ended question. You know, um, it always, uh, it, it, it always, it, it's, it's, the vantage point of it is uh, always involves man kind of staring into a conceptual abyss. Okay. Um, even that's not, that doesn't mean it's intrinsically sinister, but it's existentially disturbing because it's unknown. Okay. Um, now in Heidegger's view, man comes to live historically because this is how the question of being is answered, or at least this is the way that it's um, reconciled with human existence. Um, moment to moment, man experiences time. You know, time is time basically governs in both prosaic and profound terms, like everything man does, in an individual capacity as well as uh, in a in a um, in, in a collective one. Okay, and moment to moment. Man is forced to make decisions, and what brackets all those decisions is time and thus death. Man's always confronting his own, just oblivion generally, as well as his own death, okay? Now, what mitigates the terror of that, but what also allows man to kind of conceptualize what being is in both his day-to-day -day existence as well as in transcendental terms, is that looking at one's existence backwards from this very moment now, there's an infinite number of aggregate decisions that led to this point, okay? Um, rendered by my forebears, rendered by peoples who I've literally inherited, you know, everything from the way I speak to my folk ways, you know, it's like my biological aspects. There's this chain of existence literally stretching backwards to the very moment at which my ancestors became human. That is essentially, again, an aggregate of endless decisions rendered that constitute decisions within that temporal bracketing. And the process by which, you know, questions are posed second to second, moment to moment, hour to hour, year to year, decade to decade, epoch to epoch. And as we come to understand these things in aggregate and as an aggregate process, a dialectical phenomenon comes into conceptual view. Okay. And that's what it is really to be okay um it doesn't resolve obviously what it is but it places it in a context that is both at least rational within its bounded temporal terms and that mitigates the terror of just you know living in in, in, a, in a world of the absolutely unknown in which all beings and objects and, and phenomena are are, are just mysterious and threatening and, you know, uh, totally unknowable uh, according to the, the senses and, and, um, and the human mind. Now, that's a basically Aristotelian view, okay? I don't want to go off on how exactly that is because then we'll be here for weeks. But um, that that understanding of of a dialectical process and the temporal bracketing of that process is basically Aristotelian. Contra was essentially a Platonist view and ultimately um, what became the Christian view, which is that being is um, this kind of presence, this transcendental presence, okay? And you come to know that presence through a combination of, you know, pious commitment to knowing it and through divine grace, both of which are totally outside of temporal consideration, okay? Now, 
it's not for me to argue, nor did, he nor did Heidegger suggest that there's not priestly type men or, or, or literal prophets who can apprehend this and, you know, come to know God in this way that I, there's no reason to believe that that is not possible. Okay. But in the terms and context we're talking about, the way in which um, cultures develop around the principles that I described, specifically the way the West developed, it basically repudiated, um, it, it was basically a self-repudiating postulate, you know, like as, as the scientific perspective and as the, and as scientism, as Wolfgang Smith called it, and as, you know, the kind of conceptual biases of rationalism crowded out all other ways of knowing, you know, it's like, okay, well, we, we, we came to understand the world is just, you know, being populated by various beings that we can empirically interpret and identify. And like within that paradigm, where, where is God? You know, you, you can't identify God in those terms. Not because there's not, you know, indicators of God within the, you know, the, the, the physical world or anything like that, but you're, it's a totally conceptually, it's, it's a totally different vocabulary. Okay. So when you remove man from historical time and then you re remove him out of, um, these practices that, uh, at one time allowed him, you know, to apprehend being as a divine presence, you're, you're basically throwing him into chaos. Okay. Um, that, that creates conditions whereby every decision he's rendering proceeds ex nihilo. Okay. Um, this leads to all kinds of pathologies, you know, it, it, it leads to people, you know, it, it leads to social pathologies, you know, in banal terms, you know, because social capital breaks down, it, it leads to the deterioration of authority because why, why would people conceptualize authority as deriving from anything other than convenience or, you know, or, or power, qua power. But most, most importantly, what it does is it forces people to organize themselves according to what is knowable and what can allow them to recapture temporal um, boundaries. And that's basically the, that which is technological, okay? And this leads to uniquely insidious outcomes, okay? One of which was communism, which aside from, yes, within, Marxist, within Marxism, there's absolutely ethno-sectarian prejudices therein, like, you know, all throughout it. But in absolute terms, like where the rubber meets the road as praxis, what Marxist-Leninism dictated was basically that, you know, being is simply labor. You know, it's, it's this process of work and of working, you know, by which man can shield himself from the elements and feed himself and, you know, avoid avoid pain as much as, you know, is can be reasonably, um, as much as within the realm of reasonable expectation, you know, until, like, eventually he dies. Um, and that's it. You know, and um, there's an internal logic to that that is pretty remarkably consistent. I advise people read Das Kapital because I made the point of people, like, Marxism, Marxism is nonsense, but it's actually very well thought out nonsense. Uh, the rebuttal of that as well, you know, it's completely self-referencing. But I mean, that that's the shortcoming of every uh, of every modern ideology, like capital I, like ideology, you know, in, in the proper sense, because uh, by de by categorically by definition, its reference points are. Our, our beings, our, our quantifiable objects. So there's really, there, there, it, it, it's, you're talking about the complete abolition of metaphysics, okay? Um, 
the kind of the kind of mirror of communism was capitalism. Now there's there's a problematic term. I know people will say, well, capitalism is just a cur- a coin a term that uh, coined you know by Marxists themselves, and it appears in stuff like Communist Manifesto. That's true, but there is it's shorthand for the technological perspective, okay? Um that perspective is basically that material progress is basically potentially infinite. You know, um the world it's 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 kind of a perversion of the anthropic principle. It's that, oh well, you know, man can perceive how to exploit all these objects in the world around him and even his own body to maximum plenty, you know, to maximum pleasure, to basically infinite wealth. Um, and that's and that's basically the key to being, okay? Is this where where would tra- where would transhumanism be on that scale? It's an extreme manifestation of the latter, what I just described. And key to transhumanism, it's so it's intrinsic to it, so it's not something that's emphasized, I believe, because its proponents just take it for granted. This idea that, oh, well, there's, you know, as as we advance, we're going to resolve all matter of shortage because we'll basically be able to just kind of like create like matter from nothing. Like it's, um, it seems like a science fiction concept, although less so as time goes on. You know, in movies like that movie, <clears throat> you know, the movie District 9, have you ever seen it? Um, yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, you know how like the alien technology, it's basically this fluid, but uh, it's like a smart nanotech fluid. So if like you add it to a human body, it's going to try and like reconstitute it according to what it knows about bio- what has been proven to know about biology. So it turns the guy into an alien. If you like apply it to like a fuel source or like insinuate into a fuel source, you know, it's going to try and like purge the impurities, you know, to make it like most like combustible or whatever. That's I've noticed in transhumanism when people say like, oh, but what about sustainability or what about this? What about that? They basically always fall back and like, well, this is just going to be resolved, you know, by by, um, you know, by something by, by something that can just sort of like replicate whatever is needed, you know. Um, and uh, because that's the short that's a shortcoming of the of the of the technological perspective like writ large like at some point you like run out of stuff to be you know like um like kind of like to kind of oversimplify it you know like if there's not if there's not more things to exploit i, I mean i mean that in like a value neutral term like just if the material is not there like what do you, you you're, you're done you know well that's also the whole thing about you know in star trek you see these uh machines that just create food and it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. What, what's that machine run on? Yeah, exactly. And what happens exactly. if that's taken away? Well, it's interesting, too. Like, I don't want to digress too much, but it's like, that was the the reason why people went crazy about nuclear power, you know, like thinking, you know, the, like literal like atomic age stuff. Like, this is, you know, a, a brave new era of, of infinite energy. Like, you can, like, for all practical purposes, like, atomic energy is like power from nothing. Like, eventually, yeah, like, if your, your, your fuel source does burn out, but that's, but, but it's, it's exponential. It, it's got an exponentially longer um, life than any other conceivable fuel source. That's why. That's where you're going to see colliding more and more too. Is that these transhumanist types who think that they, who think that that's like what their utopia is, but at the same time they're like terrified of of things like nuclear power. It's like so like you can't have it both ways. <laughs> but no, that's the yeah. That's why. Um, yeah, that's that's in every. Um, well, that's one of the reasons why Dune is smart science fiction. It was a different kind of thing, but you know, like Dune deals in at planetary level, like shortage economies, which eventually everything becomes a shortage economy. You know, over on a long enough timeline, no matter how conservationist you are, you know, it's um, you know, like the Har- the Harkonnens, the Harkonnens have become incredibly wealthy, but the cost was basically like annihilating photosynthetic potential on their planet, so they're like a dying society. You know, like in Iraq as itself, you know, uh, there's there's no water. So, I mean, like, everything from the way people greet one another to, you know, the way, like, the way military doctrine is organized, you know, is accounts for, the, you know, the shortage of water. You know, like, um, the entire, uh, 
the Galactic Imperium runs on this narcotic that's also, um, you know, like a life enhancing, like geriatric, but that also has, you know, the basic, this like practical necessity of allowing navigators to, to perceive like what pathways could be navigated through space without, you know, losing, without like fifty percent attrition or something for their, for their, their guild highlighters, but um, but that's um. To bring it back, uh, like what Heidegger's what Heidegger saw in the Third Reich, it wasn't so much that he's like it was it wasn't so much that he thought Hitler himself was a heroic figure, although he may have. I mean, frankly, I made the point before, Germans didn't particularly like the NSDAP; they loved Adolf Hitler. Um, it wasn't so much that he thought the National Socialist Program was this incredible revolutionary program; it's that. This was the first time in the modern age, and at, almost, at the most critical juncture, owing to the revolutionary situation underway globally, that there was some kind of a political cadre talking about what we just discussed. You know, Hitler was saying there is a crisis in Western civilization. You know, nobody else was saying that. You know, um, whether he was wrong or right or good or evil or neither, you know, it wasn't, um, Huey Long wasn't, wasn't saying that, you know, there's a spiritual crisis in the West and that's why like our system is breaking down and we can no longer, we, we, we can no longer sustain, you know, like a, a moral or a social consensus, you know, nobody in the Soviet union, I mean, the purpose they were all dead was saying, you know, well, this is this is a confrontation basically with God and, and and transcendence. You know, nobody on this planet was saying that. I think the Japanese were, but that's a whole other subject, and that's a fascinating topic as to why um you know why there was that affinity. And um Italian fascism had something of a different source, and uh we'll get into that as we get into the Nolte proper. Um that was related to the kind of intellectual nexus that uh national socialism was but it was, it was different it was far more radical it was it was far more of um it was far more of, of of a of a revolutionary response to conditions immediately precedence but um so basically heidegger's understanding was it the the form this is going to take in um in ideological terms isn't really important. You know, the fact that this is conceptually front and center is what is important. And if this movement is allowed to be destroyed, um, there's going to be no more Europe, you know? Um, and again, not, not because he saw that there was something intrinsically sacred about the national socialist movement or something like there in Heidegger's mind, like that kind of thing wasn't even possible through political um, activity. But this was the spark of that awakening. Okay. Um, and that's, 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 that's what's important. Um, I mean, that's uh <clears throat> the uh so no enter nolte nolte was um he was a student of heidegger and he became very close to the family um he downplayed this and a lot of his opponents acted like this was something sinister or something like i nolte absolutely was not you know like running from some sinister association i mean that's preposterous it's that he he didn't want to mine clout from a man who was, you know, a, a really like an intellectual giant. And I think anybody who's serious in their study of cardinal philosophy, whether they accept all the Heidegger's postulates or not, acknowledges that, you know, um, what really, uh, the book that first put Nolte on the map was uh, The Fascist Missing Signer Epoch, Fascism in Its Epoch. It was translated in English as three faces of fascism. Okay. And this was probably the first serious treatment of fascism and national socialism 
from a critical perspective um through the lens of you know continental philosophy and political theory something that became something that had become popular in the 50s was this idea of totalitarianism and that i mean part of this was just typical kind of cold war vernacular um extrapolated to the academy and passed off as as some sort of meaningful analysis in lieu of you know just kind of cheap polemic which in my opinion it was cheap polemic but there's there's this idea um there's this kind of like pop sociological under like understanding in the academy that oh well what what really distinguishes what really distinguishes modern states from one another is that places like the third reich and the soviet union were totalitarian you know presumably in america and in, in the uk you know we value personal liberty and things and so we don't have to suffer the total state because our people wouldn't tolerate it i mean that's fucking stupid for all kinds of reasons and it also obviously doesn't account for the fact that these these, these states that supposedly share like a common like a common value system these totalitarian states like waged these like utterly devastating like ross and creek conflicts against one another but um you know nolte basically his objective was the the kind of like rebut that foolishness as well as do as well as to tackle some of the more serious critiques and treatments of the third reich but they nevertheless kind of like missed the mark um basically what he laid down is that the action francais um which who's um kind of got leading intellectual was charles moras you know he said look you know france which had uh france was kind of the proverbial canary in the coal mine um as regards revolutionary um processes obviously you know it was uh it was at the turn of the 19th century you know that france was utterly devastated by a revolutionary historical impulse so he said that nobody suggested that um a kind of a, a kind of deep-seated reactionary tendency developed in france okay and that which endures um so the opposition in france is always going to be like radically conservative okay and um people like de maestra um you know the, the counter enlightenment philosophers um there was very much like a, a francophone like stamp on this okay so he says that um emerging in the 20th century kind of like the first truly like modern like to, like in 20th century terms like reactionary movement was like the action france okay he said the re the response to that reaction were the italian fascists okay who were uh it was basically a radical proletarian movement um you know that uh it was a it was a form of both resistance to and reaction against modernity but it also embraced like certain aspects of hyper modernity you know which seemed um which seemed incoherent to people who don't really understand what was underway but um there was a uh i think that one of the reasons i emphasize george sorrell so much is because thinkers like him are kind of the tie that binds what seems like opposing tendencies but um and most significant nolte suggested national socialism was a synthesis of these two tendencies you know which themselves were a reaction against you know the tendency towards bolshevism as the new kind of um as the new uh iteration of of um you know what had what was first emergent with the jacob revolution you know thus national socialism it's both it's both radical and reactionary it's both revolutionary and conservative you know his point was uh this is this was actually a very coherent very cohesive remarkably integral um ideological program 
And it's one of the reasons people responded to it like they did. Like this idea was just some, I mean, politicians are constantly trying to, through conventional politicians, they're constantly promising all things old people. They're constantly preaching, especially in those days, uh, some kind of reconciliation between the classes. And they were getting absolutely nowhere, you know, whatsoever. But you're supposed to believe the National Socialists, um, they could just somehow like remedy these things, like good propaganda, even though there, there was no coherence to it. Like it's ridiculous. You know, like one of the reasons why they were able to capture um, the man that they were was because they were uniquely astride the dialectical process as it was either resolving or coming to pieces, however one perceives it, you know, as of, um, you know, like 1929, 1930. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, the point that even people who are partisans and standard bearers of the spirit of the age in which they live, and even men who are willing to literally kill or die for um, their ideological commitments, they may not even be fully aware of of what of, of what of what phenomena they are serving, or what or what they're participating in, and, and what's underway in in apocal terms. Um, Nolte's opinion was basically that look, philosophy lives on in political terms. You know, whatever you can say about um, you know philosophy is having been you know divorced from what's become scientific praxis, whatever you can say about, you know, anything related to um, to uh, the conventional sociology. Um, e politics, if anything, uh, has become, like, more remote from uh, the common man's ability to, to, um, to apprehend. You know, the metapolitical dimension of politics as he was observing it, um, you know, um, in uh, the early Cold War, Nolte's opinion was one of the reasons these are particularly dangerous times. It's not just because of the state of technics. Um, and obviously, you know, like the, uh, the the development of the bomb and things like this, but you've got people who absolutely have no, no ability to perceive what's underway and, and they're, they're, they're at the helm of, uh, of, um, of of great power states, um, and um, they they they're either conflating you know rhetoric with reality, or they perceive the fact that they've been able to capture you know they've been able to they've been able to rise the the front office or the or the or the, or the, or the titular head. <clears throat> of a state organ that, that at least can, you know, manufacture consent to the degree that, you know, um, they're, they're, they're not going to be removed by, by force. You know, they, they take that, uh, as some sort of like providential indicator that, you know, they're, they're somehow fit to render decisions, um, when they absolutely are not. Um, and this is important. Um, the, uh, and this was in fact, uh, this was in fact an aspect too that I believe Heidegger felt was present in in fascism. That uh mind you, there was plenty of national socialist Gauleiters who weren't particularly intelligent. Um, even those who were didn't view themselves as as some kind of like as some kind of like high priesthood of the political or something. But these guys did view themselves almost without exception as initiates in to um historical processes you know that they came to perceive either through their baptism by fire at the front as young men or you know by some sort of epiphany that a lot of people um suggested that uh they had you know in the company of hitler um i mean whether you accept that or not there was an understanding among among national socialists, among fascists. Stuff like the Iron Guard was a bit different. I look at that kind of stuff as like adjacent, but not really the same phenomenon. It was far more kind of conventionally theological. 
and and related to to what we think of as as, as the crusader impulse, like literally. But um, just the very fact that these men looked at themselves in the terms that I described it says that they were conceptualizing politics in a way that their enemies were not. Okay. Um, like the cope of, of anti-fascists is, well, that's because they were crazy. Okay. But that's not, that's, that's not, that's a non-answer. It's a non-perspective. Um, the way these people, like the true National Socialist partisans, in Nolan's estimation, um, they viewed the process that we talked about a moment ago at the outset of uh, not just you know the removal of man from history by the and by and the move, removal of man from historical time by um, the combination of the technological perspective and the deterioration of you know the ability to approach God in a either pious or or conceptual terms. Nolte believed that this would never, like man would never recover, okay? Um, If the kind of practical transcendence, what he called it, of uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, of Sovietism and Americanism reached full realization. What do you mean by practical transcendence? Okay, when man is able to master things that once were believed only to be the the the, the, the domain of God, um, that's when that's when God is truly dead in the uh, in, in in the collective like cultural mind. Okay, like whether you're talking about you know the conquest of space. Whether you're talking about the hubris of like a culture that claims like we can turn like a male into a female and vice versa, like whether, or you're talking about people who claim like you know we can, we we can we can create humans like uh, outside of a woman's womb, you know, um, just by the manipulation of um, of gametes and things. Um, yes, okay, um, that kind of thing is born of a hubris which is not remotely godly. What we're talking about, we're talking about cultural mindset and you know we're talking about the way these things are um the way these things are um are are devised according to you know um man generally man's ability to perceive it generally and um again we're already talking about conditions whereby man's ability to know god has has been irreparably compromised okay this is a basic vulnerability here you know um the uh the irony being, of course, that as this kind of practical transcendence is accomplished, you know, the absence of culture and the, the ripping out of man from these temporal boundaries um, that facilitate culture, that makes him more brutish, like more ignorant, like more impoverished. You know, it breeds literal backwardness because people no longer understand, you know, race and class anymore. You know, people no longer pursue meaningful education you know, at best, you know, like an educated man is a technician, you know, like it becomes, um, it, uh, the, um, like, like the fruit of this transcendence and this ability to create, you know, godlike techniques, um, and presumably generate wealth out of nothing is, uh, ironically a, uh, a, a kind of like, a kind of total degradation of the of the human being, you know, at scale and the absolute like annihilation of culture. And within a few generations of this, presumably the result is what Hitler said about the um the destruction of man's ability to bear culture as as being the end result of uh, an intention of a Bolshevized planet whereby people won't really be people anymore. Like regardless of the mentioned material in question, they'll have no memory of culture. They'll be they'll be an, un, unable to bear it, even if they did. You know, you'll you'll have people basically who live on the level of animals. Just they they all have an ability to you know speak and you know think um, abstractly insofar as 
you know, being able to kind of contemplate the next day what they want to fill their belly with or satisfy whatever glandular impulse by accomplishing. But, you know, they, the only thing that really makes, makes man, man is culture. There's not, there, there's not, there, there's not some anatomical thing or what have you, or, or some special structure in his brain that, that, that makes this impossible, you know? Um, and this is a, this is what was a fundamental concern to Nolte. And um, this is, I believe, why he began writing when he did as as the Cold War um, began heating up. And um, <clears throat> I want to um, I want to wrap this up in a minute because I'm not feeling great. And also, I um, I realize this is like a long introduction, man. But I think um, it's important because like. I um assuming you're okay with this because your show next episode sure. I want to get into um the historian's debate or uh the historic strait as it was called the historian's mm-hmm. controversy this is what put Nolte on the map kind of um on the academic map I mean people who people in um who had an interest in in, in continental philosophy and and in um serious scholarship of the Third Reich knew of him but it was in the late 1980s, kind of as as philosophical and politically philosophical discussion of 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 um, the Third Reich and and the Soviet Union, you know, kind of as the Cold War was um, winding down, this kind of thing was at its most intense. Interestingly, um, but uh, next episode we'll get into like how that was emergent and and how exactly Nolte became affiliated or identified, not affiliated. You know, with like Holocaust revisionism, uh, which, like I said, there's, there's nothing at all wrong with Holocaust revisionism, but Nolte is adjacent, but a different represents a different tendency. And we'll get into what I mean by that. Um, I hope that this was not too scattershot. I didn't bore people. I also, I'm not feeling great, so forgive me, man, if like my ideas were not terribly fluid. No, no problem at all. Um, do some plugs, and we'll end it. Yeah, man. I. Uh, you can always find me at uh, Substack. It's real Thomas seven 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 at Substack dot com. We got a chat there too. In addition to like my, in addition to um my podcast and like videos and other cool stuff, you can always find me on Twitter. At least for the time being, uh, they've like monetized me. So I, <laughs> I don't think they're getting imminently nuke me, but you never fucking know. It's uh at capital R E A L underscore Number seven, H M A S seven seven seven. You can always find me on my website. It's real Thomas seven 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 dot com. Real R E A or it's just Thomas seven seven dot com. I'm sorry. As you can tell I'm a fever. It's just number seven H M A S seven 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 dot com. I'm on Telegram. I'll probably get more active um as I have less time on social media to fuck around. Um you can find me on YouTube, it's Thomas TV. Do a search for Thomas Seven Seven on YouTube, and you'll find me. Um, yeah, man, that's what I got. All right, thank you. Until the next episode. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, man.